presents the podcast of OA, located deep within Sector 14845, and powered by the Emerald Light of Will. The podcast of OA is your guide to the Green Lantern universe. Hosted by Lantern Myron Rumsey, the podcast of OA begins now. And welcome to another episode of the podcast of OA. This is episode number 135. I am your host, Myron Rumsey, and I am joined by our good friend, Phil Bova. Phil, my friend, how are you doing? Great. Everything's going pretty swell here in St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah. Living the dream. Living, living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm just getting over a horrible cold. I've been sick for the last two or three weeks, which is why we didn't do a second episode in February because I didn't have a voice. And, uh, I was, uh, just time got away from me and, uh, you know, I just, with Myron being sick and my mind elsewhere, we, we just totally forgot. So we're going to write the ship and <laughs> we're going to start doing our back to our usual two episodes a month. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, since we last talked, there's been a lot of things going on. Uh, I don't know whether you saw the story that just came out a few days ago where uh, actor Ricky Whittle from American Gods uh, made a comment on the, I think it was the Sci-Fi Wire, that he had had talks with Warner Brothers about being either Jon Stewart or Simon Baz in the Green Lantern Corps film. Did you did, did you see that? Yeah, I did. I was pretty excited about it. Well, I mean, that and the fact that Idris Elba just got uh, cast as uh, Deathstroke in the Suicide Squad movie. You heard about that, right? Uh, was was it was it Deathstroke or was it um, Deadshot? Deadshot. I'm sorry. Yeah, Will Smith's character from the from the first one. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So I kind of like I was kind of like I heard that story first, the, the Ricky Whittle one, and then I heard the Idris Elba one. And I was like, because I know he was like a a runner or contender for being a John Stewart. Uh, but when uh, that news broke about him going into Suicide Squad, I hope it emboldens this rumor about Ricky Whittle. He'd be a great, great John Stewart. And I'm not even a John Stewart fan. I think he would make a good John Stewart from what I can tell. Uh, I don't know. You know, I always take with a grain of salt when an actor says, well, I've had conversations with the studio because I don't think they're even in the casting mode yet. I think it's great that an actor that is interested voices their interest in it, but you don't see a whole lot of, um, you don't see anything official coming from sites saying, yes, he's been in talks or any of those things. You know, it's all rumor and conjecture at this point. Uh, you know, best of luck to him in getting the role if, if that's the direction that Warner Brothers is looking. I think it's, he's, he'd be a good choice. The uh, the other, you know, DC movie news tonight, uh, we're recording this episode on March 7th. And tonight the embargo is lifting with comments about Shazam. And I just happened to check social media before we started recording, Phil. And so far, what little I'm seeing, um, very positive comments about Zachary Levi and this movie. I'm not surprised. I mean, it looks really, really energetic, you know, and it looks it looks like a lot of fun, which is what I which is what I, I feared DC was lacking in the earlier versions with Man of Steel and Batman versus Superman and Justice League. And there, there was a, there wasn't a lot of I mean, there was comedic content to it but it wasn't a lot of lighthearted fun and they really kind of needed that bumped up against you know the wonder woman movie and then especially the aquaman movie they needed that buffer zone to light to a lightheartedness and yeah this guy's gonna nail that character it looks fantastic yeah everything uh, you know I, I just did a quick you know look at what's being posted on twitter and and people that are able to post comments that have seen it are saying it's a fantastic film. It's lighthearted. It's it's humor. It's uh, you know Bill and I were talking not too long ago, and we were saying you know this is this is the big of superhero movies. You know it's going to be that kind of a film where uh, you know it's going to. I, I don't know. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's one of those movies where I think there's going to be a lot of serious moments in it too. Certainly the trailers are highlighting the the lighter side of it all. Sure. But I, I uh, I'm really looking forward to it, which. Uh, you know, at first, when I first heard about the casting, I was like, I'm not sure about this. I've got to see what it's going to look like. And and I'm, I'm glad I held off my judgment because it looks really, really good. Um, it looks to be my favorite superhero film of the year. <laughs> it, it, it'll never beat out Aquaman for me. But I, I am looking forward to the characterization that they're going to do with it. You know, I, and speaking of the social media, you know, I just got to say to all our listeners, you know, be cool when you're when you're slamming against other films there's been a lot of negative stuff going around about miss uh, captain marvel too and it's like you know these two are coming out at it 
just the right moment, which is oddly ironic if you come to think about it, especially when Shazam used to be Captain Marvel, you know, and they're so close to proximity of being released. And there's been a lot of negative, negative stuff thrown Captain Marvel's way. And I, I hate to see it, you know, it's, it's still a comic book movie that we can enjoy. And, you know, and I'm looking forward to Shazam more because I'm more of a DC person myself anyway. But I just, I hope everybody's cool with their commentary out there. It's just, there's a lot of toxicity to the, to the social media. Well, you know, I think it's unfortunate that the film has become this political yeah. lightning, lightning rod, you know, and, it really and has. I, I think there's, there's some mistakes being made by a lot of different parties um, that are making this a polarizing film. And it really shouldn't be. If, if it's a good film, it's a good film. It's a bad film. It's a bad film. That That's fine. But let's kind of leave the other stuff out. Um, for me, Shazam is my Captain Marvel. So, me too. You know, that that's what I'm really looking forward to. You know, and it kind of takes away from the whole Marvel family, you know, Mary Marvel and all them. And it's like, it's, it's going to be tough down the road when they decide to like, if they ever decide to interject all those characters, you know. If they're not in the movie. <laughs> if they're not in the movie. Because okay. you just don't know, you know. I don't know if you also heard uh, the WB, the their uh, chairman is a, uh, been uh in being investigated for allegations of misconduct did you see that yeah i saw that I, i'm not quite sure what to make of make of it at this point because yeah. there's been so many allegations that have proven true and so many allegations that have been proven false uh, i i hope the court of public opinion gives time for the facts to come forward me too i just i hate to see that kind of negativity i mean wb i mean love them or hate them they're they're still doing their best with what they're doing and and a lot of people drive tried to stake into them really hard when it comes to their movie making and, and films. And it's like, you know, I, I hope I hope this doesn't drown out the good that they're starting to do with these films. You know what I mean? Right, right. I don't want it to overshadow what the films are doing. And, uh, you know, speaking of big news with the DC Universe, uh, Green Arrow. I don't know if you saw the news. It's, it's ending. Crazy. And, you know, I made a comment the other day on Twitter. I don't know if you caught this or not, but. Uh, ironically, the, the comic book just ended this week, and that that's the end of the Green Arrow comic book. And somebody, it was one of the comic book podcasts, there's some or other on Twitter, posted um, about Green Arrow ending. I was like, that's kind of curious. I'm not a big fan of Green Arrow myself, but ironically, the comic book just ended this week. I wonder if that's a coincidence. And he responded to me, and he said, he said uh, from what I'm hearing, it's not a coincidence. I don't know. I mean, I, I made a mention about it'd be a nice time for uh, ML to pivot into a live action role. And uh, it seemed to get people talking about it. But I, 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 it's kind of weird that they were both ending at the same time, especially that character. It's interesting. Um, Dan Didio was on DC Daily a few days ago. And uh, he was he actually did talk about Green Arrow and he, he said, you know, Green Arrow, the book is going to be back again. They felt like they needed to kind of reset things a little bit and they wanted to be able to use him in the DC universe at large. So they were going to give him a rest and then kind of reboot again. So, yeah, I don't I don't know what their plans are for him. It, it's interesting uh, just to see what what decisions DC is making with regards to their their path. I mean, DC has been in the, the headlines recently with announcing that they were going to trim the lineup a little bit. And we're seeing, you know, the book cancellations and so on. Uh, and they they just said something about their collections are going to be less frequent but larger. So hmm, well, it, that, that's interesting. I didn't I didn't read about that one. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I I think the comic book industry is really at a crossroads. Uh, you know, I I just see more articles about stores that are closing down, and and there's a lot of allegations about Marvel flooding the market and making it hard for comic book store owners to to keep their doors open because they feel obligated to. to carry a bunch of books they don't necessarily need and there's there's things that are tied to ordering the book so if you order this if you want to order this you got to order these other things too and you know just kind of making the market difficult for shop owners which you know, that's I, a shame. It, it is it is uh you know this is this is a hobby that i love and i really don't want to see it go away and you know I, i'm sure comics will exist in some way shape or form but it's hard to watch the numbers continue to dwindle at this point well, and you know, and you, you and I, Myron, are, are you know in close in proximity to our age, and you know we've we've been at that age where we've seen them on the turnstiles in in your convenience stores and your gas marts and stuff, you know, and used to be able to that's where all you ever bought them at, and then of course 
along come the comic book stores and you know that was it it was really really big and that's where you went and there was always people in there and always and that's where you spent your money and they were always doing so well and then along came the digital age and that kind of you know stepped out on it a little bit and it's been slowly in a decline ever since and it, this mention of what you're talking about it's you know it's just it's, it's sad seeing this kind of stuff to eventually fall off you know what i mean right right well uh, i have to watch it all the whole time oh yeah 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 well you know speaking about comics in addition to this week's the green lantern number five uh we got issue number nine of the doomsday clock which has been um you know it's kind of had an anemic release schedule but yeah this the next one's the next one's delayed too. Yeah, yeah, the next one's already been announced as being delayed. But this particular issue at least had some Green Lanterns in it for the first time since this event started. And uh, you see how Jordan flying the interceptor from the Green Lantern animated series, which which made me both happy and sad at the same time. Happy to see it, sad to see that they still have it flying backwards. <laughs> there was a <laughs> that's true they do. There was a couple people on Reddit that caught it and they were posting stuff about it. So that was really neat, but uh, it was it was more mainly cameo for most of the of the characters. But Guy Gardner really stole the issue when he confronts Doctor Manhattan. Yeah, he really does. You know, you know that's typical Guy Gardner, though. You know, he doesn't he doesn't back down from anybody, and he he just walks up to anybody and and they'll have a conversation. That's why he'd be such an interesting character to meet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and in in this his his speech was really really good. Yeah, they wrote him well. I, I liked how they wrote all four, all, all, all four of them. I mean, I liked I liked Jessica. I liked the banter that was going back and forth, and I liked the comedic part between her and, and uh, Guy Gardner. I think they had a an exchange or something like that that was kind of funny, if I remember correctly. Yeah, there was you know about assuming the the gender of the villain kind of thing. That was that was humorous, and Guy Gardner creating images of you know everybody from Dark Side to the Anti Monitor. Uh, that was really kind of neat, and his speech was really cool. I think the only thing I didn't like about it was that when Dr. Manhattan and took Guy's hand in his and started to crush it, I expected yeah. the other Corsman to jump in and not, you know, not stand by and let that happen. Yeah, they kind of did kind of just back down, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. I, I, to me, that was a little uncharacteristic for me. I understand maybe that didn't didn't play into what the greater story was, but it just it felt out of character. I can't imagine uh, how Jordan, and especially kind of not jumping in into the fight right then and there, you know? Hey, let me ask you a question about this. Do you, now when Doomsday Clock first came out, I mean, it was so many issues ago and so long ago, I don't even remember what took place in issue number one, but right at this point in the story arc, I'm just kind of reading it just to finish it out because I've, I've invested this much time. I'm just going to go ahead and finish it. Unfortunately, I don't really, I don't really care for it too much, but is there an end game to this that you can theorize or is it, is this supposed to lead into something else? Is this supposed to tie into uh, another grouping after it ends? I'm, I'm kind of curious of what their purpose is with this doomsday clock. Yeah. I, d I don't really know what the overarching end game is for this thing. I mean, there's been, there's been commentary and conjecture that this is leading to the return of both the Legion of superheroes and, and the Justice Society of America, but I don't know if that's true or not. I, I don't know exactly what the the goal is. And and yeah, I'm I'm kind of like in the same boat you are where I've I'm reading the issues, but I've almost forgotten the connective tissue between them because it's been so long in between and I almost need to go back and reread all of the issues. But with such a sporadic release schedule, I feel hesitant to do that now because I know I'm probably going to need to do it again for issue 10 and maybe again for 11 and maybe for 12. So I may just wait until I may just wait until they're all done and then go back and reread the whole thing. I mean, that's that we and I remember we talked about that before, and that's, that's probably what I'm going to have to do myself. Of course, by then the jig will be up and we'll know what happens. But I, I was just curious because nobody's everybody's talking about how great it is and, you know, to each their own. And but <laughs> Nobody's talking about okay. What what's the purpose here? I mean, or the, so are the Watchmen going to be like in the DCU after this, and they're going to start appearing in other books? They're going to have their own book. Uh, is something going on with Superman that we're not know of that's going to cross over with Bendis's uh, Action Comics and and regular Superman? I just nobody's talking about any of that. So maybe if some of our listeners can shed some light on the subject, they can email you. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I think my plan right now is to reread issues one through 11 right before 12 comes out 
That'd just, be a good idea. Because because I, I want to enjoy whatever impact the ending has. And I don't want it to get lost in just reading the issue as an individual issue. So I, I think right now that's my game plan. Well, that and, and the minute issue 12 comes out, there's, it's going to be all over the internet. I mean, you know, I mean, there was a guy the other day that uh, posted a video of the after credit scene of Captain Marvel. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and I made a comment to it. I was like, you know, there should be a moratorium against this stuff, man. It's just rude and disrespectful to post this. You know, and he got kind of lippy with me, which is fine. It's his own provocation, and, and I'm okay with that. But, you know, he said, well, the only reason I posted it was because it leads into the Avengers Endgame. I'm like, yeah, man, but you just, you're just you putting this stuff out there, you know, well before the movie comes out. This was a few days ago, too. Right, right. It's one thing maybe to do it a week after the movie comes out, but doing it now? I mean. Yeah. Uh, that that I just has a bad taste in my mouth. And, you know, the, the, the more and more social media goes on, the more. More and more it continues to do that too. <laughs> true, true. Uh, exciting news. I, I don't know whether Phil, you've been following the the uh, quarterly boxes from World's Finest Collection that, that highlight different characters in the DC universe or different teams. Yeah, uh, I looked them up. I looked at. I think you posted something about it, so I clicked on it and looked it up. Yeah, yeah. They they um they do other boxes for other shows. My wife is a huge Supernatural fan, and she gets their subscription boxes, and she has loved everything they get, she's gotten in it. Usually, you get a little over a hundred bucks, hundred twenty dollars worth of items, and they're all exclusive items to the box. So it's the only way you can get them. And of course, you get a T-shirt with each one, and for, you get that for about fifty bucks. And the next one that's coming up is Green Lantern, so it's going to be about a box full of Green Lantern stuff that comes out in April. So if you're interested in doing it, you kind of need to jump on it now. And I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but uh, I'm really excited about that to see a Green Lantern box. I think the only thing they've had so far Green Lantern related is there was actually a Green Lantern power battery planter in one of the boxes. Well, and you know, and this, this goes back to, it was a box that came out from another, uh, I think it was Popco. Was that Popco that did the, the recent one with the Green Lantern stuff in it? Yeah, that was the Funko uh, DC Funko. Legion of Collectors. Yep. All right. You know, and, Come to think about it, you, if, if you really want to really, really get to the marketing ploy, I mean, this could be stuff that's leading up to the Green Lantern movie. You know, if, we, if I remember correctly, and I mentioned this before, there was a, lack, a lot of lack of marketing when it came to Green Lantern when the first movie came out, which to me, I think affected a lot of how it did in the big screen. But, you know, nobody really knew who the character was. Nobody really knew much about him and stuff like that. But this could be like little tidbits of marketing stuff that's being thrown out there just to test the waters, just to lead up for the movie, you know? Yeah, it's hard to say what's going to be in there. I'm really kind of looking forward to it. I, I have reached out to them to try to um, partner with them and maybe get a discount code or a sneak peek or something like that. But they, they so far have not responded. Um <laughs> But we'll, we'll see. Uh, Mardi Gras was last week and there was a Green Lantern float at the Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras parade, the uh, Bacchus parade that uh, it was basically the one of the themes was uh, how New Orleans has kind of become the Hollywood of the South. And they were celebrating TV shows and movies that have filmed down in Louisiana, which is where the 2011 Green Lantern movie was filmed. So there was actually a Green Lantern float at Mardi Gras, which was kind of cool. Did they have a picture on the internet? I haven't looked at it yet. Um, if you go to uh, there's a site called the blog of OA. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> uh, I do have a picture of the float uh, out on the website, so yeah, take a take a look, and I'll I'll link to that too, just for anybody who wants to see it. Uh, I couldn't find video footage of it anywhere. I was trying to get footage from the parade, wasn't lucky enough to find anything. Oh, that's a shame. There's got to be somebody out there who's got a video of it. it. Has to be. Yeah, they just haven't uploaded it to YouTube. They're still recovering from Mardi Gras, to, you know. <laughs> it's true. That, that usually lasts about a couple months. So uh, there's also some big plans in the work with us and our good friends over at the Lantern Cast. They are coordinating a big um, comic book podcast crossover event in May that is going to focus on Blackest Night. So it's going to be one of these things where a number of different shows focus on different issues that make up Blackest Night. And so they'll all tie together. And so you can get this mega coverage of Blackest Night carried over by different shows. And they have asked us to, uh, they've asked you, you, you and I to kick off the event with the first episode. And we're going to talk about Green Lantern number 43 and Blackest Night number zero on an episode in May to launch this whole event. I'm super excited. I'm super excited. Blackest Night was what revigorated my comic book love back when it came out. 
And it was right at the height of Green Lantern popularity. It was at a fever pitch at that point. So I, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to talking about it. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I was There was a research study that came out within the last few days about podcasts in general. And podcasting has really taken off. According to this uh, research group, uh, one in three people listen to at least one podcast a month. That's not surprising. I mean, it, it, has, it has gained a lot of popularity since its inception. You know, I mean... I mean, and here we are, we're talking on one right now, and there's a couple more I listen to sporadically, but I'm, I'm not surprised. And there's a lot of people I talk to that actually are making their own podcast these days. We even teach it at school sometimes. Yeah, it's really, it's really taken off. And I think some of it is the decline of interest in traditional radio and being able to um, culture you know, to harvest the content you want that's more specific to your interests. Because when yeah. you look at what's out there, if you go out to iTunes and look, there's there's podcasts about any interest you have. And, you know, to be able to cultivate that content from other people and enjoy it on demand is huge. Yeah, I've been waiting for the day that that radio comes to an end. You know, it just seems like this decline as well, you know, with the, with the music industry. I mean, everything's going digital. Everything's going streaming services or subscriptions these days, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, it was interesting. I went out and looked at um, our show stats out on the ho- podcast host that we use, Libsyn. And I was looking at our shows for the last few months. And, and we have people that are listening to this show in 37 different countries. No kidding. That's impressive, man. That's really, really impressive. That's that's flattering too, especially for you. You started this show. I I just you know I continue to be humbled because when when I started the blog, I didn't think anybody was going to read it, and I was doing it for my own my own interest to, to to basically give myself a creative outlet. And then Bill said, "Hey, let's do a podcast and 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 do some things there." And I thought, "Okay, we'll do it. Nobody's going to listen." So I am forever humbled that people uh, choose to make this show a part of their fandom and to everybody that's out there listening, I, you know, a, a very heartfelt thank you. I do really very much appreciate folks that, that make us a part of their fandom. And I hope that we in some way enhance uh, your enjoyment of the Greenlander mythology and, and, and the comics and the movies and, and the TV shows and all that stuff. I, I hope that you're getting out of this show what you want and you keep coming back for more. And, uh, you know, if, if you want to help the show, what can, what can help us get more exposure is to go onto iTunes and leave a review, uh, hopefully a positive one. <laughs> and, uh, that, that helps us get promoted so that when people search for certain subjects like Green Lantern or comics, we show up high enough that they can see us easily because it is becoming, you know, as we said, with podcasting becoming very, very popular, it's becoming more and more a crowded market. So I, so- I, I do appreciate it. And so a question into your into your data, your survey, it didn't show any kind of decline as far as when I joined because I hate on Simon Bass a lot, did it? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I didn't go back and do that kind of scientific research. Maybe I'll have to go back and do that. <laughs> to all the listeners, I love you all. I apologize. We all have our likes, but it's a love-hate relationship. So I can appreciate the fact that everybody like who likes Simon Bass to each their own. Let's <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> well, with, with that said, um, hopefully a lot of people didn't just turn off and say, that's it. I'm never listening to these guys. And I'm not listening to another one. I can't listen to Phil Basham one more time. No, no, I, I feel but, terrible. Let, let's take a quick break and uh, get a chance to wet our whistles a little bit. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about the Green Lantern issue number five. All right. Sounds great. This is Salak, Green Lantern of Sector 1418, and you are receiving the podcast of Oa. The podcast of Oa. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are going to start talking about the main event for this, this episode, and that's issue five of the Green Lantern, where Hal gets to, uh, he's marooned on a vampire planet. And Hal Jordan faces the ultimate ordeal of endurance. So, Phil, what do you think about this particular issue? Oh, it was a great issue. I just, I completely fell in love with it all over again. It was just really, really, it was really, really cool what uh, uh, Hal Jordan would had to do. Uh, I, li- I liked his tasks, you know, put on by this vampire lady. I'm not sure if I even remember her name. 
Uh, her name, it's, it's, I find myself continuing to pronounce it incorrectly, but it's Belzebeth. La- Count, Count of, Countess Belzebeth, which sounds like a um, an interesting take on Elizabeth ba- Elizabeth Bathory, which is a famous female female vampire from history. And she's a really, really she's a great character. I she just I mean Liam Sharp. I mean, <laughs> kudos to him every single issue that comes along. But I mean he just nails it every time, and he ups the ante every issue that comes along. And the way he's drawn her, I completely love it. I mean, the detail, and she just looks, she looks like a completely awesome vampire lady. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting, like every issue kind of has a different tone and feel. And this was definitely, you know, classic gothic horror. And then it was almost like a Frank Rosetta vibe I was getting at certain points. Huh, I didn't really pick up on that. Uh, you know, that, that one's part, part where he gets to the section where there's that guy, the Dark Horseman. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, it just, I, I just, Frank Frazetta jumped into my mind when I looked at that panel. I'm like, wow, that's really, it's really neat. And there's, there's some really, there's a couple of really cool things I, I do want to talk about. And that's with Liam Sharp's artwork is that whole panel in the beginning where uh, Bezelbeth and Hal are talking and you see all these vampires. Did, did you catch some of the references to those? Oh, okay. Hey, okay. I see him. Yeah, I see him. There's Lestatis there. I see him on the left. Yep. And then and then you see the other character. The uh, You've got the Tom Cruise character and uh, I can't remember his name now. Oh, Brad Pitt. Right. Brad Pitt. Yep. There. And then right above Brad Pitt looks like the Gary Oldman, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula when he would turn into a vampire bat, half vampire bat guy. There's him. And then there's Morbius right up there the, from Marvel that kind of sneaks his way in. Now on on the right over there, who's uh, who's uh, the the two white guys? That looks like, that Doctor Jekyll and Hyde, is it? Well, there's there's the guy with the beard and the long hair and the vest. Yeah. And the and the he reminds me of there's a vampire character in a movie that uh, Ty Wakiti, the guy that directed Thor Ragnarok and played um, Tom Kalmaku in the Green Lantern movie. He directed a film, a comedy. It was a vampire comedy called What We Do in the what we do in the shadows and it's a vampire comedy film. And he looks very, very much like one of the characters in that. And he's standing next to a guy that could either be another character for that film or an Asferatu. Oh yeah, that's true. That's true. That looks like to the right of him. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that I thought was really cool. And then, uh, you know, what I didn't know, and I saw Liam Sharp acknowledge it on Twitter the other day, there's the scene where Hal goes into that crypt to find, the 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 headpiece right the black stars and there's that shadow you see of a guy lying down with a little cat staff that's um I, and it looked very john schneppy and it, it was a tribute to john schnapp the late john schnapp um who was a writer director and and he did the he did the documentary about the um the superman film that never made it Right. Oh, that's right. The one, uh, the one with the, that ain't the one with Nicolas Cage, was it? Yep. Yep. And he did a whole documentary about that, that film that never got made. And he, he was on Collider for a long time and he was just, just a really sweet guy. And he passed away last year, unfortunately. And Liam Sharp and he were friends. And so that was a little tribute to him. Is that, that's him in the armor, correct? Yeah. Lying there with the, lying there with the, uh, the cat staff above him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Really, really cool. I would never have picked up on that. I, I, when I first saw it, I thought, gosh, it kind of looks like John Schnepp, but I wasn't sure. And I didn't want to ask him because I wasn't sure what the relationship was. But then he came out on Twitter the other day and said, you know, yeah, this is my, you know, this was what was nice about this a particular episode. This particular issue for him as an artist was being able to include that tribute to his friend. That's really, really cool. You know, I mean, that's really, really neat when, when uh, artists get to do that. This reminds me back when uh, the Lois and Lois Lane and Clark Kent wedding album came out and all the uh all the the people who put that issue out they were all in the the audience during the wedding oh yeah 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 that was cool yeah it's really really cool i just i like when artists get the to get the, the the liberty to do that it just goes to show that you know where they get their inspirations from you know <laughs> There was a there was a neat thing that happened. Um, the Raging Bullets podcast, who have often mentioned, has been an inspiration for me. Uh, Sean Whalen and um, his his friend who record that show, um, Jim Segulin, they were they befriended uh, Gail Simone during the Suicide Squad run that she had, 
And sure. they were, she was on their show a number of times and they actually drew their names on headstones in a scene in an issue, a panel of that book. That's really, really cool. Go them. Gail Simone. I like her too. She's really cool. But uh, back to this issue, definitely got the core vibe. And, you know, this wasn't so much about advancing the plot. You know, I mean, obviously how had to become a black star, but this was really uh, the first time that Morrison really does the deep dive into Hal's psyche. And I, and, I, and I like the darkness of it. You know what I mean? I like I like the whole horror vibe like you were talking about. It really, really made it kind of it kind of mirrors a little bit of the, the Blackest Night stuff. But it's but it's nuance and, and how Jordan hasn't been through this kind of experience before. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of the comic fans, I th- think they shortchange how they don't think he's a very deep character because they only see the surface betrayal. And it's he's never been the character that that, that talks about how he feels. And, you know, you have to kind of get it through what he's he does and what he, what he says without saying anything. You know what I mean? And, and you. And- you can you can do no more than to say exactly what he said on that page, right right below it. You know, I've lived, I've died, I've been reborn. You know, I relived my dad's death and every betrayal a thousand times. I'm a founding member of the Justice League of Planet Earth. So let's get, so let's get serious. I mean, that's just typical Hal Jordan, you know. Right, right. And because I don't I I don't do inner demons and I don't do regrets. <laughs> Classic. And that's perfect because I remember when I first read, right when I looked at it and he read that, I'm like, he had to say that because that is, that is Hal Jordan. I mean, that's, that's his commentary. Yeah, exactly. And and I thought it was great because I think there, there are, there are some readers who can read between lines and pick up on, on the subtleties and the details of the character without having to have it told to them. And there are some that don't. And I think those that don't sometimes don't get the character or they shortchange the character because they don't see anything besides the guy who makes quick decisions or perceived is perceived as not having any decision-making abilities. And this really kind of just puts it right out there for you. And I've always thought of Hal as having this, this certain, this certain suave and this arrogance about him, but he's not in your face about it. He's pretty much, he's, he's arrogant and suave, but he's selfish when he, I, I feel like he's selfish when he does it because he has his intentions and the good intentions of those around him in mind, but he's not in your face so much to be like, yeah, just get out of my way. I can take care of this myself. I don't need your help. You know what I mean? And that's then, what he, that's what he says. But what he really feels is I know I'm not going to get hurt because I trust myself to take care of myself. So I'm going to put myself in harm's way. So you're not, you know, the, 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 the people that have said, you know, how Jordan's the man whore of, of the DC universe. Well, if you look at that character and look at the relationship between his mother and father and how, what his father's occupation did to his mother and how that was somewhat of a wedge in their marriage and Hal saw that firsthand and saw how his mother reacted to his father's death. Well, Hal doesn't want to put someone he loves in that same position. Right. And not a lot of other characters can, can make that same claim. You know what I mean? Like a lot of the other characters are either both parents are gone or, you know, they're or they're alive and they've just gotten their powers. You know what I mean? Right, right. And I think the, the, the he feels like, well, I still need human interaction. I still have the same drives that any other, you know, adult human being has. So I don't want to be Mr. Right, because if I'm Mr. Right, I put someone in that position. So if I can't be Mr. Right, I'll be Mr. Right now. Right. Uh, and, and so... I think, you know, that that's a, definitely a part of that character. There's just, there's more going on underneath there when you start to, to think about why he does certain things he does. Sure, you could take it on a surface level, but there's a lot more going on behind the eyes than what you think. And and Morrison does a great job of just bringing it forward and he puts it right out there and he, he gives kind of the Hal Jordan mission statement. Right, he totally does. And he nails it in the commentary. I mean, you could, you could really see how uh, Morrison's development over the issues is it's gradually getting better and better and better because each issue keeps raising the same, raising a new bar, you know, even with the artwork, you know, the artwork with with sharp is just, I mean, every week it just gets, or every time it comes out, it just, it gets better and better to the depth of what you can write and what you can draw. Well, yeah. And I I think they complement each other very well. You know, I think Morrison is creative and he gives Liam Sharp, I I think, the ability to do certain things that he wants. But at the same time, I think he provides oodles of detail. 
Yeah, he really does. I mean, there's like I said, there's not it's not a page that goes by where you don't you don't have a blank slate. And he, and he fills all the lines. It's great. What do you think of the 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 horseman at the towards the end? Yeah, yeah, that was that was where I, I thought Frank thought saw Frank Frazetta artwork in my head as soon as that yeah. came up. And you know the paint the panel layouts are interesting. the The whole book is just visually engaging, and I think that the Morrison is bringing the best out of Sharp, and I think Sharp is bringing the best out of Morrison. Uh, and what about the flashback with the uh, Guardians? I I was not surprised by that at all i think you know we've talked about it before that how we knew Hal was going undercover and that this was all a ploy uh, i i think that you know we saw the death of the one character a couple of issues ago i think we'll find out that that character's still alive it was faked right um you know so it didn't surprise me but it was nice to see them go back and kind of do that flashback and give us that level of detail right get a little bit of a clean slate so people weren't worried about that how jordan was a big douchebag <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and we've seen him go renegade before. Here's a case where, you know, the Guardians are saying, hey, you know, you you have this propensity to kind of go rogue. We want you to play on that. Right. And then he becomes the Black Star Parallax. Yeah, yeah that was that was kind of interesting where he says, you know, call me Black Star Parallax. I was like, well, boy, here we go. <laughs> it's interesting how he chose that. I mean, of all, of all the things he chose, he chose that. Which, by the way, I, I, I still have to say... Renegade Hal and uh, Parallax Hal Jordan are two of my favorites, but Spectre is close up there too. I, I kind of wonder if he chose the name Parallax because if any of the Guardians or the Green Lanterns hear it, they'll know it's Hal. That's a good point. I did not consider that. Or any, not only just the Green Lanterns, but also think about the Yellow Lanterns too. Right, this could right. Be, this could be a way to tie in Sinestro. Yeah, I mean, there's different ways it could go. Now, were you surprised by the the last page with Adam Strange? Yeah, I really was. I didn't expect to see that. Now we know, we, but we know. I mean, what well, we don't know, but the true readers to, to Green Lantern that go way, way back, and then they're, they're they're familiar with. You know, Adam Strange's not going to die, right? He can't die. So it's going to be interesting how they're going to come out of this. Yeah, I, I don't know what they're going to do there. I, I can't see, excuse me, I can't see Grant Morrison killing off Adam Strange no. uh, at all. And it's interesting because Hal and Adam Strange go back a long, long ways. You know, yeah. years, and, years and years ago, Adam Strange was a backup in the Green Lantern book. Interesting. I didn't know that. Man, I, or I don't remember it. That's probably more at the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a time, a long time ago, where uh, you had a you had a backup tale in each book, and it was an Adam Strange thing. I've and always liked Adam Strange. I think he's a cool character. I think so too. It's interesting that that uh, they're pairing him up again. But I, I again, I think it's Morrison is not. He's looking at the history of Green Lantern and still mining those things from the past that make sense and throw them in. Uh, I know one question I wanted to ask you, because you and I both were fond of the Venditti run, probably more of the the New 52 version of the Venditti run than the pre-New 52 version of the Venditti run when um, or or more more along the lines of when uh, Venditti was doing the Hal Jordan book where he had more creative freedom. Mm -hmm. Does it bother you that there are elements from the Venditti run which are being kind of ignored here? Yeah, it does. I mean, Venditti left a a, a long stretch of material. I mean that. I mean, like, take for instance, I I miss the New Gods. You know, I wish there was a way that the New Gods were going to factor into the Green Lantern book in some fashion or another. Because I liked, I liked them two tying into one another. You know what I mean? Um, and not only that, but Venditti really, really, like I said, he just really, really, he really, really laid a lot of inf- a lot of material groundwork out that could have easily been interwoven into the story moving forward. But then again, Grant Morrison, you know, he's, he likes his own style and, you know, he, he probably wants to pull stuff from maybe stuff from a long, from a while back. That's not so much remembered because it looks like DC is really, really hearkening back to their to their golden years. I mean, if you think about it, the Legion of Doom is is starting to be thrown around a lot. They're even appearing in the Justice League now, and and you even mentioned it yourself with Doomsday Clock and maybe the return of the Justice Society of America, and subsequently all these older characters that it looks like they haven't been around in books before for a while seem to be being brought to more to the forefront. You know, Adam Strange is no different. 
Yeah, you know, I, I'm one of those guys that, for me, I, I try to think about the DC universe as a living, breathing, fictional place. And so it does bother me when there are plot elements that are kind of ignored. You know, I, and when I think about the Green Lantern franchise right now, I think in particular about the fact that, uh, you know, the whole Rebirth Initiative in that first issue, Hal Jordan forges his own ring out of willpower. His ring isn't the same as everybody else's. But that's kind of been overlooked. It has. It really has. And you had you had said that a couple times before, you know. Yeah, you know, and that bothers me a little bit. Or things like Hal doesn't have his power ring on, supposedly, because he's still but he's still got his uniform. That's true too. I didn't even really think about that to be honest, to be quite honest with you. And and, and sometimes I I'll be honest, sometimes as a reader it takes me a little out of the story because I, I, I can suspend my disbelief and I accept the rules of a universe, but then when the books or the movies or what, or TV shows or whatever the medium is, when it, when it violates its own rules, it tends to bother me a little bit. And sometimes I actually lose my enjoyment of certain things because of it. And it hasn't bothered me too much, but then there are times when I'm like, well, wait a minute, this isn't exactly the way it works. And, and then there are other people who read comics and they're reading it for the stories and the continuity doesn't matter at all to them. The story is, is key, is, is the critical part. Yeah, I've noticed it a lot with different kind of readers, you know, and people who you talk to about and what they read, you know. And that's a good point. Yeah, I, I think everybody's, you know, different in their own ways. But I, I do struggle with it sometimes, to be completely honest. And I know that's me. And I don't want it to um, detract from my enjoyment of the book. But at the same time, there are times when I'm like, gosh, you know what about this? And what about that? And I, I guess, you know, I, it's hard, I guess at age 54 to tell yourself to let it go. <laughs> oh, it is. And it gets, it gets harder as every year goes on. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm 45, so I'm right behind you. So by 46 or be things I don't want to let go, you know, things that are even harder to let go, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been reading comics since I was, you know, seven years old. And it's so old habits die hard. And when, he, when I was a kid, it seemed like it was easier to, uh, believe the universe was it's uh, was almost a real place in my imagination because the books used to kind of follow each other pretty well. There were things that didn't sometimes line up, especially when writers changed and creative teams changed. Yeah. But by and large, it, you felt like there was this organic universe going on. And I, I know I have struggled since Rebirth with all of that. Well, and if memory serves, I mean, I don't know if DC Comics, I don't know if the comic books are doing the same thing or not, but... I mean, I know their continuity with the films are going to take a break from connectivity, you know. So, I mean, there might be a part of the comic books themselves that are doing the same thing. I mean, if you look at Green Green Arrow ending, you know, and, and subsequently if they're dropping other titles and stuff, I mean, they might be doing a shift in, in how, how their connective tissue works with their connected universes, for that matter. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know when it comes to the movies, they've kind of said, well – we don't feel that we need to connect every movie at the hip to every other movie. So sure. to, uh, to get back to the, to the comic book, right. Right. We're, 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 we're we got, we, we started going down for another road and I'm like, Oh, we better get back to the comic. I hope uh, that reflect on our data. I hope we don't lose any <laughs> listeners on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, this, this issue to me, it was a real winner. I, I, I didn't find anything I really didn't like about it other than perhaps, um, there was maybe a little bit too much talking about Bezelbeth giving Hal clues, but to me, I've looked, I likened it to, to Hal, um, Hal kind of keeping her talking enough that she gave up the information that she really didn't want to just by him carrying on the conversation. And Grant Morrison has to build up the dynamic between these two characters. If indeed there's going to be a showdown with them. And she's really, really an interesting character and a good adversary for Hal Jordan and, you know, Green Lantern Corps in general. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to where it's going next. I, I, I'm, I know, you know, in my heart that he's not going to kill Adam Strange, but a boy, I might want to see what, what's going to take place next because you can see Adam Strange instantly recognizes Hal and he's like, "Oh, thank God you're here," and then he's like, "Something's not right with Hal," and I, you know, I think it's Hal playing playing a role, but we'll see. I think he's still playing the role. I think you called it early on, and, and he's undercover, and he's gonna he's gonna play that role at the core, and he's good at it too. Definitely, definitely. So yeah, solid issue. I totally agree with you. I'm, it, the, the, they're getting better and better. You know, like I said, I, I had some, I was resistant at first. You know, first issue, but that's just jitters. You know, 
two came along and it, and, it, and it eased up a little bit and three and four kind of, okay, this is getting really, really good. This one just makes it emboldens it even more. Yeah. I, I think this was my favorite issue. Really? Okay. That's, that's, that, uh, that, that's a fair bet. I mean, it was, it was solid. I liked issue four. That's been my favorite so far. Yeah. And I don't know whether, you know, I, I tend to, because it's fresh in my mind, it's the latest issue. So it's the best issue because it's the most relevant. But I, I ordered the, uh, I ordered the variant cover from uh, Joe St. Pierre. Oh yeah. Yeah. I got to go pick that up at my comic book store this weekend, but I, I ordered that one when it came out. That was a great cover. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. It's kind of got how there were this, this really interesting background. It looks like a Tron kind of, <laughs> kind of photo, you know? Yeah, yeah, you're right. It kind of does. <laughs> so, yeah, totally into this. So it's a great, great series. Morrison and Sharp are doing a great job. And from what I've read on on a lot of the social sites, you know, they're they're getting a lot of appraisals for this. Good. It's well-deserved. It is. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll be back in just a moment and we'll wrap things up. All right. Sounds good. Welcome back. Episode 135, Green Lantern number five. Onward to the next one, right, Myron? Absolutely. Best issue yet, by your by your claim. I'll stand by it. And issue four was my favorite so far. Um, I like where the story's going. I like what Morrison and Sharp are doing, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the future of Green Lantern. Me too, me too. I, I, I think it was a great issue, and I enjoyed sharing some of the commentary from earlier and, and uh, you know, talking a little bit about uh, where things are going with the DCEU, if that's really what it's still going to be called. But uh, we'll see what happens. And also, remember, people, about the uh, comic, uh, Comics Podcast crossover. We'll keep you up to date on it and check Myron's website frequently because I'm sure he'll post some stuff on there about it. Yep, absolutely. As soon as I get some more details as to uh, where people can tune in to all the various parts, I definitely will be posting that out there for folks. I'm so super. I'm so super excited about this. It's going to be like reliving Blackest Night again, and I think I need to get like the the Blackest Night director's cut edition. I think they got a director's cut edition or something. If you get, if you get, I have the ultimate edition, the absolute edition, and is that, is that what it is. Yeah, it's, it's an oversized book, so the pages are like one and a half times normal size. Wow! It's all oh, that's a big hardbound one, right? Yeah, yeah, with a slipcase cover. Oh, yeah, it's gorgeous. God, I wish I would have gotten that when it came out. I never got that one, it's a, but I do need to read it. I have Rebirth that way. I have Sinestro Core War that way, and um, and I have the Blackest Night that way. That's very cool, and that's a really good collection to have. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually it's not it's not too bad price wise. I think when you can get it, it's hard to find right now because it's kind of out of print. But yeah, so you got to get it on eBay, and they're asking a lot on eBay. Are they? Wow. Yeah, yeah, I looked up the Sinestro Core one. It's going for about hundred bucks, eighty to hundred bucks or something. Wow, it's not bad, but you know, it's still an investment. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I was looking at Amazon. Doesn't have it have it at all either. No, they don't. Nope, nope. And I'm I'm just scrolling out to see if they have it in uh, <clears throat> on InStockTrades.com, and I, I'm not seeing it there at all. Yeah, so it, it could be it could be it's a gone book. And I hope not. That that would not be fun. Yeah, here's the uh, the Sin- the absolute Sinestro Core War, 174. Wow. Yeah, that went up. <laughs> and then the Rebirth one is uh that's up to 80, about 80 bucks. Wow. I mean, you you can get the 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 Jeff Johns Omnibus cheaper than that. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> oh well. Huh. What are you gonna do? You know. Nothing. Buy it because that's what we do. Because we're suckers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll we'll make plans as long as neither one of us gets sick to do an episode later this month that is a double retro review book episode. Yeah. So I got to come up with a I got to come up with the one that I'm going to do. See, so, yeah, I've already done Kyle Rayner. I've already done. Have I done Simon Bass? No, I don't want nope. to do Simon Bass. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, maybe I will. I don't know. I'll let you know. <laughs> Uh, we we did Guy Gardner and we did the, we did him already. Uh, yeah, so we did Green Lantern Rebirth. Okay, so I'll come up with a good one and I'll get a hold of you by uh, 
either the, the middle of next week or no, the beginning of next week, I'll get a hold of you. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it ironed out. Right. But all right. Well, everyone take care and we will talk to you soon. Uh, until next time, as I like to tell everybody, keep your power rings charged, treat each other well and make every day your brightest day. Sounds great, man. I love it. Love hearing it every time. We'll see you guys later. The podcast of OA is the official podcast of the blog of OA and a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. Share your comments and questions by calling the show's voicemail line at 406 Pod of OA. That's 406 763 6362. You can send your emails to podcast at blogavoa.com. You can also find the blog of OA and the podcast of OA on Twitter and Facebook. Green Lantern and other related characters are the copyrighted property of DC Comics Incorporated and are used without permission. The Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa are fan productions and do not claim any ownership over the Green Lantern or any other copyrighted properties.